The uh, title of the sermon this evening is Finish Strong. Finish Strong. And this is uh, a phrase that I've been thinking about lately. And it's something that as I was reading the scripture, you know, I see this with this guy Asa. This was somebody who started out doing really well, but ended up not finishing strong. And we'll see more detail about that. And, I, and as I was reading through and reading about his life, I thought, you know, that this guy is a perfect example of not finishing strong. And really what we want to use him as, as, as a warning and use him as an example of what it takes to finish strong. And I mean, in any endeavor in life, you know, whether it's as a parent, whether it's as a church member, whether it's as at your job, there's so many different areas you could apply this phrase to, to finish strong. And especially when it comes to the Christian life, we all want to get to the end of our Christian life, at least we should, and say like Paul, I have finished my course. You know, I have kept the faith. You know, that is, that is the goal for every Christian. You know, that's the goal that I have as somebody who is preaching to a body of believers. That's what I, would, that's what I desire to see for every person in this room. Mm-hmm. Is that with, you know, it, when they get to the end of their life, they can look back and see a life of service to the Lord God. That they can say, hey, I finished my course like Paul did. Yeah. So I wanted to look at Asa tonight and just look at some of the, char- the things that he did well but also some areas where he failed that caused him to not finish strong. Now, if you notice there in, in 1 Kings chapter 15, you know, he, he did a lot of things right, but it says, nevertheless, in his old age, he was diseased in his feet, you know, and that was a curse that came from God. And we'll see here, we're going to get into it, but and if you would, go over to 2 Chronicles chapter 14. Actually, I'm sorry, keep something there. Well, let's look at 1 Kings 15 first. Okay, it says there in verse 9, In the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, reigned Asa over Judah, and forty and one years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did his father. So this guy starts out right. I mean, he's doing the right thing. He was a good king. He was a good man. I believe that. And I mean, look at some of the great things that he did. I mean, verse 12, right? Amen to this. And he took out away the sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. So he's getting rid of all the idolatry. He's getting all the wicked abominations out of the land. And he says even here in verse 13, you know, that, that's verse 12 is kind of easy for us. You know, it's easy to just kind of, oh yeah, well who wouldn't want to get rid of the sodomites? Who wouldn't want to tear down all the idolatry and abominations in the land? But verse 13 is kind of maybe a little bit harder. Maybe we couldn't all say like, like Asa that we'd be willing to go this far. You know, he was no respecter of persons because it says, and also Maacah, his mother, he removed her from being queen. Mm. He's saying, sorry mom, you got to step down. You're, you're fired, you know, because she made an idol in a grove. And Asa destroyed her idol and burnt it by the uh, brook Kydron. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's always worried about knocking over mom's vase or whatever when she comes home or her favorite lamp or something. I mean, he's going in there and taking her favorite idol and just smashing it, you know, and and burning it at the brook Kydron and saying, too bad, mom. No, no apologies. I'm not going to get you another one. (laughs) So Asa, I mean, he's doing so well, you know, in his life. And I want to kind of mention this because this is worth mentioning that is that he did so well that he was that God was even willing to look over some of his shortcomings. You'll see that a lot with the kings. You know, they'll say, you know, he walked in all the ways of his David, his father. You know, he did that which is right. His art was perfect before the Lord, except for this or that. And I'm not saying that's an excuse for these people to have sinned or done what they've done. But, you know, it's this principle in Scripture that, you know, if we're doing the right thing, even if we have a sinful past, even if we've done things wrong in the, in the past, you know, the Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all our sin. You know, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I kind of, I wanted to just throw that out there tonight because that's something that we need to be reminded of as well. But it says here in verse 14, but the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. And he brought in the things which his father had dedicated and the things which he himself dedicated into the house of the Lord, silver and gold and vessels. So he was so right with God he did so many things that were pleasing the Lord that even in his, the few things that he kind of fell short, God was kind of willing to kind of overlook that. God was gracious unto him. So Asa, he starts out right. He, he starts out a good man. And go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 14. But unfortunately for Asa, he didn't finish strong. And that's what we want to do tonight. We want to look at Asa and see where did he fall short? What, what caused him to not finish strong in his life? Well, first thing... Before we get into that, I want to just point out some other good things about Asa. If you're there in 2 Corinthians chapter 14, you know, Asa took advantage of the opportunities that were given him. When he had opportunity to, to do things, he took advantage of it. 
It says there in verse 1, So Abijah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa his son reigned in his stead. In his days the land was quiet ten years. So when Asa first takes over the throne from his father, it says there that the land was quiet ten years. And Asa, you know, he takes advantage of this time that he has not to please himself, not to just be at ease, not to just get relaxed, but to actually, uh, you know, prepare for what was ahead. He took advantage of the opportunity that God gave him. God gave him a land that was quiet for 10 years. And look at verse 2. And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. For he took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places and break down the images and cut down the groves and commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, to do the law and the commandment. So he's teaching the word of God. He's breaking down the idols. You know, he's seeking, he's doing that which is right and good in the eyes of the Lord while he has this time of peace. And it says in verse 5, And he took away out all of the cities of Judah, the high places and images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. <clears throat> so he's doing all these right things. You know, he's taking advantage of the opportunity that's given him by teaching the commandments of God, make, getting people right. But not only that, you know, he, he, he was like a wise man which foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, as it says in Proverbs. You know, he prepared for the battle in a time of peace. He, didn't re he realized, and this is a principle that we could all learn well, uh, do well to learn rather, is that in times of peace, you know, don't, don't just take it, take it to the bank that that's the calm before the storm. Calm. You know, about, it, it seems like every time, you know, there's three stages in life. You know, you're either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or heading into the next one. And when you're coming out of that storm, you know, when things seem peace, peaceful and calm, that's when we should be preparing and, 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 and you know, uh, putting down our roots, getting in the Word of God, memorizing the Word of God, getting ready for the storm that's going to come, the next persecution or tribulation or whatever it's going to be. And that's what Asa did here. You know, he took advantage of the opportunity that was given him. He prepared for battle in a time of peace. Look at verse 6. And he built fenced cities in Judah, for the land had rest. And he had no war in those years, because the Lord had given him rest. Therefore he said unto Judah, Let us build these cities and make about them walls and towers and gates and bars. Not those kind of bars, folks. While the land is yet before us, because we, sought the, we have sought the Lord our God, we have sought him, and he hath given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. So when he has this time of rest, you know, he's not just sitting on his laurels. He's not just lollygagging. You know, he's actually taking the time to build some defenses. And, you know, that's something that we need to do in our life. If we're going to finish strong, you know, when we have a time of rest, when there's a time of peace, that's not the time to back off on your Bible reading. That's not the time to back off on prayer. That's not the time to back off on Bible memory and getting to church, that's the time to take advantage of the peace that you have, the, the opportunity that you have to go to church. <laughs> I mean, come on, after what you just went through with this coronavirus, you know, who knows when they're going to shut that all down again. You know, that's the time to go and take advantage of what's available to you. That's the time to build the walls and the towers and the gates and the bars is when things are going well. You know, when, th when the enemy comes, if you haven't taken the time to, to get in the Word of God and, and put down your root and, and really, you know, stay, uh, build yourself up in the faith, you know, you're not probably not going to be, you're, you're not probably going to put much of a resistance. I mean, think if they decided, you know, instead of building all these things, they said, well, let's just go outside and plant some trees and build a splash pad and, you know, put up a roller coaster. I mean, when the enemy finally came, they would have said, man, these people are defenseless. They'd have just blown right through them, right? <laughs> and he started with a good defense. You know, he's putting up all of these walls and towers and gates during this time of peace. You know, that's a good time during the, when, when things are going well, that's a good time for you to get the sin out of your life. You know, when everything's going well. I mean, that's, you know, that should be our natural, you know, uh, response. When everything's are going really well, kind of be the kind of person who's expecting the bubble to burst. You're like, man, things are going so well, what's the catch here? You know, and maybe that's the time to say, you know, let me, let me not uh, take this uh, for granted, but actually examine my heart, my life, and see if there's any sin and get it out. You know, and also, you know, he didn't forget the offense. It says in verse 8, Asa and Asa had an army of men that bear targets and spears. Out of Judah, 300,000. And out of Benjamin that bear shield and drew bows, 204 thousand. All these mighty men of valor. So he's got all the defense made. You know, during the time of peace, he's putting up the bulwarks and the towers and the gates and everything. But he's also got the offense. You know, that's a good time for us to get in the Word of God, get the sword of the Spirit, you know, get that thing sharp, get that, you know, ready to go when things are going well. Because the battle is sure 
to come. Look there in verse 9. I mean, he gets all this taken care of just in time. And there came out against them Zira the Ethiopian, Ethiopian with a host of a thousand thousand and three hundred chariots and came unto Marisha. Okay, so math quiz. How many is a thousand thousand? Come on. Who knows it? Somebody knows it. That's right. It's a million. See, I knew somebody knew it. I should have, I should have you waited for me to offer something, you know, like a piece of candy or something, right? That's a million people. And he says, and 300 chariots and came unto Marisha. So he's outnumbered. You know, he's got 300,000 out of Benjamin and he's got 204 score thousand. So, you know, he's got what? About 500,000 people. So he's outnumbered two to one, basically, by these Ethiopians. But you know what? He, he did that, which is right. You know, he started out strong by building a defense, by building an offense. So when the enemy showed up, he was ready. He wasn't scared. He wasn't going to get run off. He didn't back down from a fight. Look here in verse 10. Then Asa went out against him and they set the battle in array in the valley of Zephatha uh, uh, at Marish, Marisha. And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord God, for we rest on thee. And in thy name we go against this multitude. O Lord, thou art our God. Let not man prevail against thee. He didn't back down from a fight, folks. He, had, he went out there and with faith and took on this enemy that outnumbered him two to one. It reminds me when David went out against Goliath who just towered over him when he was just you know, a lad with his, with his, you know, his shield and his, buck, you know, and, his, and his sword and his spear and the guy was just armed to the teeth and all David had was a few rocks. But what did he go? He went in the spirit of the Lord God in the name of his Lord, of the Lord God. And that's exactly what Asa is doing here. He's going out against this great host that outnumbers him with all these chariots, but he's going in faith, you know? And why was he able to do that? Because during the time of peace that he had, he prepared himself. He was, you know, getting the sin out. You know, he's, he's getting the spirit in. He's putting up the defense and he's building the offense. <clears throat> you know, and that should show us too that, you know, all these defenses that he built, all these weapons that he had, they're nothing without God. They're nothing without God. Why was he so bold to go out against a, a, a company that had him outnumbered almost two to one? Because he went in the Lord, the power of the Lord God. <laughs> like he said there, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against the, thy multitude. No, he wasn't putting his confidence in the, the thing, all his preparation. He wasn't putting his confidence in the actual physical weapons. He was putting his confidence in the Lord God. <clears throat> that's what we need to do. Now look here in verse 12. He said, uh, So the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people that were with them pursued them. So now they're putting them to flight, and they're chasing them down unto Gerar. And the Ethiopians were over, overthrown, that they could not recover themselves, for they were destroyed before the Lord and before his host, and they carried away very much spoil. And they smote all the cities about, round about Gerar, for the fear of the Lord came upon them, and they spoiled all the cities, for there was exceeding much spoil in them. They smote also the tents of the cattle. So it wasn't just enough to, that they defeated all the enemies. They go ahead and they get after the cattle too. They're even picking on the animals. And they carried away sheep and camels in abundance and returned to Jerusalem. So Asa here, you see, is a guy that's starting out very strong. You know, he's doing everything right. He's getting the, 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 the sin out of the land. He's no respecter of persons. He's telling mom to step down, breaking up her idol. You know, he's, uh, he's taking advantage of the peace that's given him in his days. And he's building up the defenses. He's building up the offenses. And more than that, you know, he's trusting in the Lord as God above everything else. So when the enemy came, he was ready. He started out very strong. But unfortunately for Asa, he didn't. <clears throat> now, go over to 2 Corinthians. He didn't, excuse me, finish strong. But go over to uh, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 15. 2 Chronicles 15. So he has this great victory. Everything's going great. He's starting out strong. <coughs> and after this, you know, uh, he's also even encouraged further by the preacher. You know, the preacher then comes to him and off also offers him this, enc these, this encouragement. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 1. It says, And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear me, 
uh, hear ye me, Asa, and all the Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while ye be with him. And if he seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. Now that's something that Asa should have really laid to heart. That's something he really should have stopped and, th and thought about because unfortunately this was his undoing. <laughs> it says in verse 3, Now for a long season Israel hath been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. But when they in their trouble did turn to the Lord God of Israel and sought them, he was found of them. And in those times there was no peace to him that went out or nor to him that came in, but great vexations were upon all the inhabitants of the country. And nation was destroyed of nation and city of city, for God did vex them with all adversity. So he's basically lifting up Jerusalem, because remember, it's Jerusalem and Jerusalem. At, Jerusalem and Judah at this point, you know, the, the kingdom has been divided. He's saying, look, God will bless you guys if you seek him. He'll be with you. He'll bless you if you do his commandments. You know, he's going to, uh, he's not going to forsake you if you do not forsake him. And he says, don't be like, now he's lifting up Israel and saying, look what's happened to Israel. You know, they've been without the law. They've been without the true God. And all these bad things are, are coming upon them. So he's encouraging them, this preacher, Azariah, but he's also warning him too, saying, look, you could turn out just like Israel if you're not careful. Be ye therefore strong, he said in verse 7, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. <clears throat> now the most important part of this message that Azariah delivered unto Asa, Asa was this, in verse 2, the Lord is with you while ye be with him. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. You know, if you want to finish strong in the Christian life, you need to keep that in mind. You want, because it's going to take the Lord. Because, you know, the Ethiopians are going to come with their thousands and thousands, and they're going to bring their chariots, and they're going to try to bring you down. You know, the, the devil's going to try to get you out of church. The devil's going to try and get you out of the, reading the Bible. He's going to tempt you. He's going to try and draw you away. The world and the flesh, your, even your own flesh, is going to fight you every step of the way in this Christian life. And if you aren't prepared, you know, he's going to get you. And, if, and more importantly, if you're not with, if you don't have the Lord on your side, you will fail. Right. <clears throat> Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. He said, abide in me. And he said here, look, the Lord is with you while you be with him. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. If you want to finish strong, you have to have God on your side every step of the way. I mean, Asa just experienced that for himself. He knew this was true. I mean, he's seeking the Lord in those 10 years when he has all this peace. He's, you know, he's teaching the people the law and to do right and breaking up all the idols and, and getting all the wickedness out of the land. He understands this. He gets it. This isn't just some abstract notion to him. He, he gets this. He's like, yeah, that's right. Amen. He's amen and probably amening this, this, this preacher. <coughs> And this experience that he has, this preaching, this experience, you know, it, it really inspires Asa's zeal. And I'm just pointing out the fact that, you know, Asa started out very strong. Asa could have gone down as one of the great kings in the Bible. Now, of course, you know, he was buried with, with his fathers in the sepulcher of David, and with, in, in, in that, which is an honor in and of itself. You know, so he did do a lot of good things right. But unfortunately, you know, people tend to remember the worst things about people. And people always tend to remember the worst things in life. And people tend to remember the last things that you did. You know, so if we don't finish strong, you know, we'll be like Asa. We'll remember, and we'll say, remember, what was that king in, in, uh, back in Second Chronicles and First Kings? What, what, what was his name, Asa? What was that about him? Oh, yeah, the guy with uh, the diseased feet. That's what people typically remember. Not the guy who ran out the Sodomites and break down the idols. You know, he started out really well, but he didn't finish strong. Mm. And he has all these great things going for him. And, you know, he even, he, his zeal that he has at this point even inspires all these other people. Look at verse 8. And when Asa heard these words, the prophecy of Obed the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of the land and of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities which he had taken from Ephraim and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon, for they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. I mean, he's starting out so strong, he's doing things so well that even people in uh, you know, neighboring Israel who they were often at war with is saying, let's go back. Let's go back and worship the Lord with this guy Asa. Look what's, what's happening now. There's this revival was taking place. <clears throat> so they gathered them together, verse 10, at Jerusalem in the third month, in the 15th year of the reign of Asa, and they offered up unto the Lord the same time the spoil which they had brought, 700 oxen and 7,000 sheep, 
and they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord their God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul, that what, whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. I mean, this guy is just on fire. People are coming to him, flocking to him. They're in this huge sacrifice to the point where, hey, if you're not going to get with, right with God, you're going to meet him. <laughs> you know? they're, they're ready to just start slaying people who, you know, who want to go worship Baal and these other gods. They're done. This is a revival taking place. Asa started out so strong. It's a tragedy the way he finished his life. And they swear in the Lord their God with a loud voice and with shouting, with trumpets and with cornets. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart, and they sought him with their whole desire, and he was found of them. And the Lord gave them rest round about. And also concerning Maacah, the mother of Asa, the king, he removed her from being queen because she had made an idol in a grove. And Asa cut down her idol and stamped it and burned it at the book Cridron. But the high places were not taken away out of Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all his days. And he brought unto the house of the God the things his, that his father had dedicated and that he himself had dedicated silver and gold and vessels. Verse 19, and there was no more war unto the five and thirtieth reign, year of the reign of King Asa. Of Asa. So he goes through this great battle. The preacher come and tells them all this. Hey, you be with the Lord. He'll be with you. Don't forsake him. He won't forsake you. This great revival takes place. And then there's, you know, even more peace. And he has, you know, experienced. So in his days, you know, Asa experienced these two periods of peace. When he first came on the scene, you know, in those 10 years, he had peace. He fights this battle. And it says, uh, I'll remind you of, uh, well, you already know that, he, that the land was quiet 10 years. And God gives them all the time to prepare for the, the battle with the Ethiopians, Zira, and, and God delivers this message by Oda the prophet, and that just inspires his zeal. It leads to the second period of peace that lasts about 25 years. But despite how well Asa started, he failed to finish strong. I mean, we see all these great things going for him, but you know what? His life didn't end up well. He did not end up finishing strong. Are you there in 2 Chronicles chapter 16? It says in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 1, in the sixth and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa, Baish, uh, 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 the reign of Asa, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah. So here comes another enemy. And built Ramah to the intent that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa brought out the silver and gold out of the treasures of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and sent them to Behanad, king of Syria, that, went and that dwelt at Damascus, saying, there is a league between me and thee, as there was between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent thee silver and gold. Go break the league with Baasha, king of Israel, that he may depart from you. What's he doing here? Who is this? It's like a different person. Where, where, where's the Lord in all this? I mean, he's taking the stuff out of the house of God. Verse 2, he's bringing out the silver and the gold out of the treasure of the house of the Lord because of this guy that comes up, in, uh, up against him out of Jerusalem, this king, Baasha. And it's like a different person. This time goes by, and then all of a sudden, it's like, it's like you're reading about a completely different person. He's not going to finish well. And Ben-Hadad hearkened unto King Asa and sent the captains of armies against the, Israel, the cities of Israel, and they smote Ijon and Dan and Abelium and all the store cities of Naphtali. And it came to pass when Baasha heard it that he, fled off, that he left off building Ramah and let his work cease. Then Asa, the king, uh, took all Judah, and they carried away the stones of Ramah and the, built, and the timber thereof, wherewith Baasha was building. And he built therewith Geba and Mizpah. Now it sounds like thing, everything turned out okay. This enemy flees. He takes the timber and he goes and builds more of his kingdom. He goes and he builds, you know, uh, uh, Geba and Mizpah. But what was he, who was he trusting in at this point? Was he trusting in God? Look, when you're taking the silver and gold out of the temple of God to, to, buy, to buy mercenaries, you're not trusting in God. You're trusting in man. And this was the beginning of the end for Asa, a guy that we just read all these great things about that was just had this huge revival, was started out so well, but failed to finish strong. And what was the, what was the beginning of the end for him? He put his trust in man rather than God. He put his trust in his own strength, his own wealth, his riches, rather than putting his strength in God. I mean, it's like a completely different guy. When, that, when the Ethiopian up comes up, yeah, he had all the defenses and the offenses built, but he prayed and said, Oh, Lord God, it's nothing to, with thee to help, whether by few or by many. But here, there's no prayer. It's just, oh, there's, there's, there's trouble. 
Well, let's just go get the silver and gold of the temple of God and see if we can get some people to fight, run these people off. And that was the beginning of the end when he put his trust in man rather than God. Look at verse 7. And at that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said unto him, Because, excuse me, because thou hast relied on the king of Syria and hast not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. I mean, he could have been like the Ethiopians that they chased down and, and took all their animals from. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many uh, chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. He's trying to remind them. Don't you remember when you were outnumbered two to one all those years ago and God delivered them into your hand? Because why? Because you relied on the Lord and not your own strength. Look at verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Now, that's a promise that we still have today. God, has, God hasn't closed his eyes, friend. They're still running to and fro in the earth. And, you know, and if we'll be like the Asa of old, where we rely on God, God will, shill, will still, to this day, show himself strong on our behalf. If we trust in him and not in man. Here and thou hast done foolishly. Therefore, from thence thou shalt have wars. He says, oh, you're so concerned with peace. You're so worried about the enemies. You're so worried about things going wrong in your life. Well, you know what? Since you're going to go ahead and rely on yourself and rely on man and rely on your own riches, now you're just going to have nothing but trouble from here on out because you didn't rely on God. Now it's just going to be wars for you for the rest of your days. And of course, Asa, you know, he takes it so well, right? You would expect at this point, he, you know, many other, there have been other people in Scripture that when they would have heard that, like David, thou art the man, I've sinned. You know, he would have just confessed if he had any humility. But what does he do instead? He turns on the preacher. He doesn't like the message that he's hearing, so he turns on the preacher. And Asa was wroth with the seer and put him in a prison house. He said, who are you to talk to me like that? Don't you know who I am? I'm King Asa. And he locks up the preacher, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. He doesn't like the news that he's getting. You know, that, that's a good lesson for anybody who wants to preach. You know? The people you preach to might not like the message you have to tell them. And they might feel the same way. I don't, I don't know, maybe you guys will shove me in the closet someday and lock the door and run out, right? <laughs> Say, how do you like that, Brother Corbin? I'm just kidding, but, you know, that is the reaction that some people that give. I mean, so this guy, I mean, he started out so strong. He started out so well. He had so much going for him. But you know what? Things were going pretty well, and it just goes to show you that, you know, prosperity and peace sometimes aren't the best things for us. Sometimes it's always had good to have a little conflict to kind of keep us on our toes, to keep us relying on the Lord. He thinks, oh, it's 20, you know, 25 years go by, I can just kick back. It's peace in my kingdom. And then when an enemy comes up, he's totally forgotten about God. You know, he relies on man. The Lord curses him for it. Says, you know what? It's going to be wars from here on out, buddy. He sends his preacher. And then he just locks up the preacher. And not only does he turn on the preacher, he also turns on the people. Look there at the end. It says, and Asa oppressed some of the people the same time. Maybe the people that sided with the preacher. You're like, you know, hey, Asa, did you hear what, did you hear what uh, uh, the, the Hanani, Hanani, the seer, said to Asa? Yeah, amen to that. We agree with them. And they, maybe they would have said, Asa, you should probably listen to the preacher. Oh, I, you know, oh you agree, you're on his side? Well, I'm going to lock you up too. I'm going to press you as well. So what he's doing, what is he doing here? He's hardening his heart. And this is just this downward spiral to where he just, you know, he ends his life very poorly. Started out strong. Started out a great man, you know, a man that did a lot of great things for God. Had a lot of potential going for him. But then, for whatever reason, just blows it all at the end. He hardened his heart. He doesn't learn his lesson. Look at verse 11. And behold, the acts of Asa, first and last, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Asa, in the thirty and ninth year of his reign, was diseased in his feet, until the disease was exceeding great. Yet in, in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. He continued to rely on man. It's like some people don't get the message. When he's even diseasing his feet. I mean, don't you think... Wouldn't any normal, rational person connect the dots here? I mean, do you think Asa was stupid? No way. You, he, of course he understood where that disease came from. I mean, he's saying, well, I'm being, a, you know, I can't, 
Uh, I, didn't, I wasn't able to defeat the host that came against me. You know, they got away from me. The, the Hanani, the seer comes and preaches against me and tells me it's going to be wars. And now I've got this disease in my feet that becomes exceeding great, meaning it's like taking over his body. Mm. Don't you think at some point he, he would have, you know, got right with God? That he would have said, hey, let me seek unto the Lord in all this. Let me get my act together. Mm. No, he hardens his heart and he didn't learn his lesson. And it ends up, you know, and Asa slept with his fathers, verse 13 and died in the one and fortieth year of his reign. And what, what does Asa go down as? The guy with bad feet. <laughs> right? The guy with diseased feet. That's how his life ends. And they buried him in his own sepulchers, that he, which he had made for himself in the city of David, and laid him in the bed, which was filled with sweet odors and diverse kinds of spices prepared for the apothecary's art, and they made a very great burning for him. So he throws this huge funeral for himself. You know, he's got... He sees the end coming. He's like, well, let me get my sepulcher built. Let me get all the orders together. And by the way, when I go, there better be a very great burning for me because I was such a great king. <clears throat> but he ended very poorly, didn't he? I mean, he's locking up the man of God. He's oppressing the people. He did not finish well. And it just goes to show us that it's not how you start the Christian life. It's how you finish you know, and there'll be ups and downs along the way. Nobody's the Christian life isn't just this, you know, rocket propelled, you know, linear growth. Just I'm just better, better every single day. You know, the Christian life is ups and downs. You know, some of us, you know, they're, they're a little more severe, but over time they start to, you know, pan out. It's not so wavy of a line over our life. It's not how you start the Christian life. It's how you finish it that counts. I mean, there's so many examples of this in Scripture. Let's just look at some New Testament ones here. I mean, Asa is a great example of somebody who started out great, but because of the hardness of his, of his heart, from him getting away from the Lord, because he forsook God, God forsook him, because of all that, you know, he ended up not finishing strong. You know, the example of Demas in Scripture. Go over to, uh, 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 where am I going to have you go? Uh, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Demas is an example of somebody who started out good but finished bad, just like Asa. You know, the Bible says in Colossians 4, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. I mean, Demas is somebody who was, you know, right there with Paul, right there with the other uh, the apostles, right there with the other servants, Timothy, uh, Luke. In the Bible says in Philemon, Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord, having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee. And he says there in the end, verse 23, There salute thee Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. I mean, he's counted as a fellow laborer alongside Paul. Demas started out really well, didn't he? But did he finish well? Because that's what counts in the Christian life, how you finish, finishing strong. <clears throat> he said in verse uh, uh, 2 Timothy 4, verse 9, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me. You know, I've only run into one kid named Demas. <laughs> only one. And when I found out that's what they named him, I was kind of like, why did you name him that? <laughs> I didn't say that, but I'm thinking, you know, are you going to name him Asa? Is his middle name Asa by any chance? You know? You might want to get him some, uh, what's that, athlete's foot or whatever? The, the spray or whatever? What do they call it? I don't know. Get that spray for his feet. I don't know. <laughs> But Demas, he started out great, right? Fellow laborer. He's right there, you know, rubbing shoulders with Paul. All these other men of God. But, you know, what does he go down as being known as? The guy who forsook Paul. Having loved this present world. Got tired of the battle, tired of the fight. And decided, you know what? I'm just going to love the present world instead. Now, on the, uh, the complete opposite, you have the example of Mark. Go over to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. It's how you finish the Christian life, folks, that counts, not how you start. Even if you get off to a bad start. You know, some people, they, 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 uh, they get in church, you know, they start living for the Lord, and they really, they're new to it, they really don't know what they're doing, they make some mistakes, they think, say things they shouldn't, they do things they shouldn't, they have to, you know, repent, they have to say they're sorry, you know, whatever. They have ups and downs. All that can be glossed over, all that can be forgiven and forgotten. But you have to be able to finish strong in the Christian life. It's how you finish, not how you start. 
he says there in uh, Acts chapter 15, this is a great example, Mark is a great example of this. Look at verse 35. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many other al others also. And some days after Paul said to Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take them with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, uh, th with them who departed from them from Pamphylia, kind of like Demas. He departed from Paul already early on, right? And went not with them to the work. So here's another guy just kind of, you know, got tired of the work. Got tired of being, you know, around this Apostle Paul guy. You know, some, 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 guy, some men of God are just a little, you know, you stand too close, you, got, you pick up a little heat yourself. And they said, you know, I just, I'm just kind of getting over it. I'm not going to go with you guys. So when, uh, <laughs> when uh, Barnabas is saying, well, hey, let's take Mark with us. Paul's like, well, don't you remember what happened in Pamphylia? Yeah, we didn't want to go to the work. He said, no, let's not take him. And Mark is a guy who's starting out the, the Christian life bad. Look, when the man of God is saying, no, we don't want that guy. That's not a good sign. That's when, we, when, so when the man of God is, when, you know, when the seer is coming and warning you, when the man of God is saying, we're not going to take you with us, you've got some things to figure out, you've got some things to work on, you know, that's time for introspection. Why? Because you can still finish strong. Because you're just starting out in the Christian life, you still have the opportunity to finish strong. And look, I mean, Barnabas, you know, it says in verse 39 that he, wa he was like insisting. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder from one, one from another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. So, you know, credit to Barnabas here. Maybe he saw some good thing in Mark. It was like, look, I know Mark messed up. I know he's made some mistakes, but there's some good things in him. Yeah, he, he's starting out bad, but he could still finish strong. So he takes him with him. Now look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. I should have had you keep something there. I'm going to have you go back there again later too. Sorry about that. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4 again, verse 9. He says in verse 9, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me. Example of a guy who started out great. He's mentioned as one of the fellow laborers, but later, you know what? What happens? He has forsaken me, having loved this present world. And has departed in Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, and Titus to Lamatia. Now I don't think Cretans and Titus He's just saying, they're not with me. I don't think they forsook him having loved the present world. They're just out doing the work. That's my opinion. But look at verse 11. Only Luke is with me. And now who is he asking for? Take Mark and bring him with thee. Now Paul is saying, hey, will you get Mark? Will you bring Mark here? For he is profitable me for the ministry. So here's Paul, you know, in the beginning had said, no Mark. Sorry, Barnabas, not happening. The guy is lazy. The guy didn't want to go to the work. The guy is just not up to the task. If, if he goes, I'm not going. Right? But now, fast forward, after Mark's been hanging out with Barnabas, doing the work, you know, getting things right, he's able to finish strong to the point where now, at the end of his life, Paul is saying, bring Mark to me. Yeah. He's profitable for the ministry. Yeah. Look, Mark's an example of somebody who finished strong. Yeah, yeah he started out bad, but he didn't, pull, he didn't go full Asa, right? He was able to pull out of that nosedive that he was in and level off and make something of himself for, for, the, for, you know, for God's work. And notice he says that he's profitable for the ministry. You, know, you want to finish strong? Finish strong in God's work. I mean, people, they put a lot of effort in, in, into finishing in, uh, strong in things that have no eternal value. True. Finish strong in the Lord's work, in the ministry. And by the way, it doesn't have to be this ministry. Notice what Paul said there. He said he is profitable to me for the ministry, right? There, you know, this isn't the only, this church isn't the only place that's in the ministry. You can be in the ministry in other places than just here. But what matters is no matter wh where you are, whatever ministry you're part of, that you finish strong for God. <clears throat> so the charge here, look there again in 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is what Paul wants for everybody, for the people, you know, and this is what any preacher wants for any people that he preaches to. Anybody that he's pastoring over is that they finish strong. And let me tell you, you know, you don't have to be around very long to see people who, who just fall out all the time. People just throw in the towel and quit and just go, they just go, de they pull a Demas and they just go full back into the world. And I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm not saying you're not going to see them in heaven, but you know what? They're not going to finish life strong. They're not going to get to heaven and have the rewards that they could have. <clears throat> and Paul gives Timothy a charge here.
to finish strong. Look at 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. I charge thee before God and Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the quick and the dead at the appearing of his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering doctrine. For the time will come when they do not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves, having teacher, teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. He's saying, make full proof of thy ministry. What is, what is he telling him here? To finish strong. To do all of it. Make a full proof of it. Complete the work that has been given to you. And what, you know, in the process of doing that, you know, if you're going to finish strong, look at verse 5 again. You're going to have to watch thou in all things. You know what else you're going to have to do to finish strong? Endure afflictions. It's not going to be easy. I mean, if it were easy, everybody would finish strong. And there, there would be no Demises in the world if it were easy. It's not easy. The Christian life isn't easy. Let me just break it to you right now if you haven't figured that out yet. Right. It's not the popular way to live your life. The, the world, you know, the world's not going to embrace you over it. There's going to be afflictions that come, and they're many fold. They're going to you know, come in all different forms, from all different sources over the course of your life. Yeah, there'll be seasons of rest like Asa had, but there'll always be that next enemy that's going to come and bring affliction. Just mark it down. You want to finish strong, endure afflictions. Not only that, do the work of an evangelist. That's the charge that he gave Timothy. He said, look, I want you to make full proof of thy ministry. I want you to complete it. I want you to do the whole thing. Do the work of an evangelist. You know, that's a work we can all do. Not everyone's going to get up and preach. Not everybody needs to. You know, but everybody can do the work of an evangelist. And if you're going to finish strong in the Christian life, you're going to get to heaven and have actual rewards in heaven you know, silver, gold, precious stones. You need to do the work of an evangelist, folks. You need to go out and win souls to Christ. Or at the very least, just preach the gospel. You know, some people, they go out, and if we don't get anybody saved, it's just like, why do we even go? <laughs> what was the point of that? It's so hot. Well, is the command, is the command to win, or is the command to go? Command. It's to go. Right. You know, whenever, even if I go to the most unreceptive neighborhood and come back and no one's gotten saved, I feel great because I obeyed the commandment to go. Amen. I did the work of an evangelist. Right. I'm making full proof of the ministry. I know that I'm going to finish strong if I keep doing the work of an evangelist, if I keep enduring afflictions. That's the charge that Paul gave to Timothy. And, that, you know, and he walked the walk, folks. It was the example of Paul too. Look at verse 6. He said, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now, <laughs> again, I'll point that out. Part of finishing the course and keeping the faith is what? Fighting a good fight. Because you know, there are many adversaries. There's a great door open and effectual, but there are also many adversaries. The, you know, the devil as a roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour. We have an adversary. We have an enemy. You know, spiritually speaking, and he's crafty, you know, and there's going to be some fights along the way. And if you want to finish strong in Christian life, you better get ready to fight the devil and be ready for afflictions and be ready to do the work of an evangelist. If you're going to say like Paul, I've finished my course, I've kept the faith. And what did he say in verse 8? Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Look, what, what in this world is going to compare to the crown of righteousness in heaven? Nothing. Not a thing. What are you going to lift up in this world? What, is, what did Demas go after that, that, that was so much better than the crown of righteousness? That he said, yeah, you know what? It's not worth it. The love of the world, you know, having the, 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 the cares and the riches of this world, are they're so much better than the crown of righteousness. Sorry. That's not finishing strong. And he's going to regret it. You know, Demas is up there right now probably kicking himself. And he's like, oh, great, another Demas sermon. <laughs> You know, I'm afraid as a preacher sometimes when I get, when I get up there, some of these guys are going to take me aside and be like, hey, buddy. <laughs> you know, while you, were, you were, while you were watching me, I was watching you, and I noticed a few things too. Wow. You know, you might take it out on my hide while I get up there, right? So I'll be, I'll be careful, you know. But hey, you know, these things are in the Scripture for the reason. Demas started out strong, but you know what? Where is his crown of righteousness? Is it even there? He didn't, he didn't do what Paul did. He didn't finish the course. He didn't keep the faith. <clears throat> what is it that keeps people from finishing strong? Trusting in man. But ultimately it's this, peace and prosperity. 
when they when people just they're all they're concerned about is just making life nice and comfortable mm. and they just want everything to be exactly the way they want it a lot of times that's people's undoing and it causes them to not finish strong asa had peace right he had 35 years of peace in his life he didn't finish strong demas loved the world and he goes down as a de you know demas the defector <clears throat> What keeps us, what's going to help us finish strong? Suffering, toil, conflict. That's what's going to keep us in the fight, not peace and safety. I mean, Paul had his share, fair share of that, you know, and he was following, and if you would, just one last place, John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Say, why was Paul willing to endure all that? Why was Paul willing to endure afflictions and go through all the things that he went through? in order just to finish the course, just in order to finish strong. Because he was following the example of Christ. Look at uh, John 19, verse 28. This is, the, of course, the crucifixion. It says in verse 28, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished. I mean, Jesus finished his course. Jesus went all the way to the end. He finished strong. He said, all things were now accomplished that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel of, uh, full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon a hyssop up to his mouth. When Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Those were his last words. It is finished. You know, and that's what Paul was able to say, I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. I fought the good fight of faith. Because he was following the same exact example. Are we going to be able to say that at the end of our life? Or are we going to be more like Demas? Right. Or are we going to be more like Asa? Mm. And at the end of life, all we've got are diseased feet. If we want to finish strong, you have to stay in the good fight for the faith. Let's go ahead and pray.